welcome to chapel today. We hope you had a great time yesterday at Living Groups getting to know your new honorary Living Group members from One Vision Orphanage in Haiti. Thursday is gonna be a praise chapel with a theme centering around love. First of all, God's love for us and then our love for God. And we ask that you remember a pen or a pencil because we are gonna write some fun little Valentine's notes for our new honorary Living Group members and hopefully get them to them as soon as we can. So. Will you please join and sing with us? Higher than the mountains that I face Stronger than the power of the grave Constant through the trial and the change This one thing remains And Help welcome Mariah's brother in law, Ryan Chase. Good morning. It's good to be with you guys here. Um, my name is Ryan Chase, and I'm a, a pastor in Sioux Falls right now at a church called Emmaus Road Church. And Prior to that, I taught high school Bible at Sioux Falls Christian for the last nine years. So uh, I think I have some, some sense of what life is like for you here in a Christian school. And um, I love what I hear about what God is doing here. And it's a, an honor for me to be with you this morning. James was one of almost 650,000 men who was drafted for the Vietnam War. And he tells this story that in basic training, the drill sergeant was a, a really tough guy. He was always yelling at these draftees when they were doing field exercises, lying on their bellies in the mud in some shallow foxhole. He would 
step down on the backs of their helmets and yell, keep your head down. Sometimes he would kick them so hard it made them see stars. He was always yelling, keep your head down. Some of the recruits hated him for this. I mean, they, they resented this man. In fact, James and one of the friends that he made, a guy named Andy, they, they made a vow together one night back in their barracks that when they returned from Vietnam, they would go back to this base and find that sergeant and kill him. Finally, the day came for those Marines to ship out. They flew to the South Pacific. They boarded these troop transport ships, and they headed for the Mekong Delta. They offloaded near shore. They waded onto the beach, and immediately the Viet Cong came against them. Bullets whizzing past their heads, mortar shells bursting all around them. James and Andy dove for cover together behind a sand dune. They were frightened. They were overwhelmed, terrified, blood throbbing through their ears, nearly drowning out the sounds of the war. And after a few minutes, Andy looked up to see where the enemy was. There was a crack and a pop. Andy's rifle fell from his hands, and James looked up to see only sky where Andy's head had been. He slumped down behind that dune in shock and disbelief and horror. And he heard his drill sergeant's voice, keep your head down. So when James returned to America, he went back to that base. And he put on his uniform and he grabbed his rifle and he headed over to the barracks and he found that drill sergeant. And he reached out and he shook his hand and said, I kept my head down. Thank you. So my question for you this morning is this. Are you a James or are you an Andy? Both went to boot camp. Both got the same training. Both heard the same warning over and over again. Keep your head down. Both of them at one time felt resentment toward the man who gave them that training. One heard it and did it, and he lived. One heard it, and he didn't do it, and he died. I taught in a Christian school for over nine years. I taught high school Bible, and I have taught a lot of Jameses, and I've taught a lot of Andes over the years. I've had students who have contacted me in college, after college, to tell me how they are walking with the Lord, how their faith in Jesus Christ has sustained them in hard times and in good times, in adversity, in temptation, in the midst of all the, the doubts and pressures thrown at them by professors and roommates and classmates, and they've contacted me to say, I'm walking with Jesus. I'm holding fast to God's word. Those things you told me that I was tempted to tune out, they have been life to me now. And I've heard all kinds of complaints and excuses. Maybe you've said things like this, or maybe you are sitting next to somebody who said things like this to you. I have heard these stories from the Bible a million times. I grew up in a Christian school, and I'm so sick of it. I've had those students. I had one student who said, you know, I think I would be more interested in the Bible if I didn't have to go to Bible class or to chapel every week. You would be more interested in the Bible if the Bible was out of your life? How not quite sure how that works. Or students who would say things like, I hear the same stuff at church on Sunday and on Sunday night and on Wednesday night and in chapel and in Bible class, and I'm just, I've had it up to here. I'm so sick of this. I can't wait to get out of here. Maybe you've had thoughts like that. Maybe you feel like teachers and administrators keep stepping down hard on the back of your helmet, telling you, keep your head down. And you're thinking, I just can't wait to get out from under that. I have a gracious word for you this morning. From God. For you. From Luke 8, 18. If you have a Bible, you can turn there for yourself. Luke 8, 18. Jesus says this. These are, these are kind words from Jesus. 
So listen. Take care, then, how you hear. Take care. Be careful how you hear. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. My aim this morning is to convince you that Jesus is better than anything life could ever offer you. And that Jesus is better than anything that death could ever take away from you so that you will cling to Jesus with all your might by faith today and tomorrow and every day until you breathe your last. And that you would bear fruit by clinging to Jesus. There is an incredible opportunity before you attending a Christian school. The word of God is like a seed that is sown, Jesus says. He says this right after telling the parable of the sowers. I'm sure that you are well acquainted with that parable. And Jesus says, the seed is like the word. And there are some who hear that word and they receive it and they bear fruit and they yield a harvest a hundred times what was sown in them. And when I think about the seeds that are sown in your heart day after day after day, year after year after year throughout a Christian education. Oh my goodness, the harvest that could come from your life as you live bearing fruit with that seed a hundred times what was sown. Think about what is sown in your heart and your mind here and think about what a hundred times that would look like until the day you die. The word that is sown, that is the seed, or more specifically, Luke says in the rest of his gospel, that word is this, Luke 24, Jesus says to a couple disciples who were confused about why he had to die, he says, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Some of us are slow to understand and believe what we're hearing. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And so beginning with Moses, you know that, Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, the rest of the Old Testament, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. The word, the seed that is sown in your heart is all of God's word and all of it, Jesus says, all of it. Moses and the prophets, everything in the Old Testament, everything in the New Testament, it's all about Jesus. You know that. I know that you've heard that before. Luke 24, Jesus says, uh, it says, Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written, this is God's word, that the Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. You know that. Christ died the death you and I deserve to die for the, the wrong, the contempt, the scorn, the injury that we have heaped on the glory of God. And he died so that we might be forgiven of our sins. And he rose from the dead for our justification. And that message of forgiveness of sins in Jesus is now to be proclaimed to the ends of the earth. We have the good news for the world. And I'm not telling you that because I don't think You've heard it before. I know you've heard it. The problem is, hearing it isn't enough. There are different kinds of hearers, and Jesus says to you this morning, be careful how you hear. He doesn't say, just hear. He says, be careful how you hear, because lots of people hear and don't receive it. Lots of people. In the parable of the, the soils, Jesus says that there are three ways not to hear, and there's one way to hear. Three ways not to hear. Jesus describes those who are like the path, the soil that's packed down, walked on, it's hard and firm, and any seeds that fall there, they don't take root. In fact, they're, they're snatched up. In Matthew's account of this parable, Matthew says it like this, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. Those who hear the word and don't understand it. 
I don't know if any of these students exist here, but I had them over the years as I taught high school Bible students who just didn't understand. We had a student once who was, didn't grow up in a church, a Christian home, came to Christian high school for the first time, totally unfamiliar with the Bible. They were in one class going through uh, the crucifixion and the part where Jesus is on trial before Pilate. And after the class, she went up to her, her Bible teacher and said, so why is there a pilot in the Bible? I didn't think they had planes back then. I mean, she just didn't, she was not familiar, and there are people like that, but I've had other students who have heard it their whole lives, and yet they don't quite understand it. Maybe they've got doubts or questions. I had one student, his sophomore year of high school, he was in trouble for some behavioral issue, and I was sitting there talking with him, and I was sharing with him that there was hope for him, that his sins could be forgiven through Jesus. And he looked across the table at me, and he scoffed, and he said, what you just told me? I've heard that a million times, and I'm so sick of hearing that. And I said, I know, but it's the only message that will change your heart, so I'm just going to keep telling it to you over and over again, because it's the only hope you have. The next year, his junior year, he came to me, he told me that he had gone over to his friend's house, went to a public school by God's providence. This is crazy. This friend was born in Thailand, grew up in Canada, moved to Sioux Falls, grew up in a Hindu family, heard about the gospel at a public school, put his faith in Jesus, and shared the gospel with a kid who grew up in a Christian school. They sat there from 10 p.m. till 4 in the morning, and this kid just kept telling him about Jesus' death for his sins. And this student of mine kept saying, yeah, I've heard that, I've heard that, I've heard that. He told me this morning, because I asked him if it was all right if I shared this, he said it was around 4 a.m. that all of a sudden it was like his eyes were opened and he said to this Hindu who's become a Christian, why have I never heard this before? That's the best news I've ever heard in my life. And he came into my class and he told me, how come nobody's ever told me this? And I just smiled and said, that's all I've ever been telling you. And God has now given you ears to hear. So what about you? Are there questions that you have? Are there doubts that you have that you've yet to face and address? Jesus says, here's another way not to hear. There are some who are like the rocky ground. Some seed fell on the rock and it grew up, but it withered away because it had no moisture. So when the sun came, the heat came, it just died. It had no root system. Jesus said, that's like those who hear the word and at first they receive it with joy, but when Hard things come. They have no root. Hard things come in life. Some of you have already been through hard things. And some of you will go through hard things sooner or later. I've had students who battled cancer as kids. Uh, a student of mine whose entire family was killed in a car accident. Hard things come some people hear the word, but they never receive it in their hearts convinced that Jesus is better than anything death could take. And so they start thinking hard thoughts about God. God's not good. God doesn't care for me. God doesn't love me. God has abandoned me. And all of those hard thoughts about God are like these rocks that keep you from sinking the roots of your faith down into the life-giving water of the Spirit. And there's no life then. So what about you? What hardship or what setback or pain in your life is tempting you to think some hard or bitter thought about God? Those are the rocks that will keep you from sinking your roots deep. Throw them out like your life depends on it. The last way not to hear Jesus says is like the seed that fell among the thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it. Jesus said, that's like those who hear, but as they go on their way, they're choked by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. The cares and the riches and the pleasures of life choke it out, and some of you right now are in danger of that life being choked out because the world looks so good to you, and it will kill you and choke out any life, the only life you could ever have in Jesus. I've had students who knew how to fake it throughout their entire time in Christian school. One bright student scored super high on the ACT, went off to college, and then it was found out that for months he hadn't been going to class because he just drank every night. And his parents are paying for this expensive school. 
all this promise and potential, and the world just looked so good to him. And any appearance of life that was there was choked out. And I think it's a gracious thing that his parents found out and he came home, and I'm still praying for his soul. I have a student who uh, is a young man now, has a child on the way. From a woman who's not his wife, he's trying to figure out what to do in that situation. It's all around you all the time. And I want to convince you that Jesus is better than anything life could ever offer you. So those are three ways not to hear. Oh, be careful how you hear. You are already a hearer of the word, but are you a James or an Andy? Here's how to hear. Jesus says, the good soil, the one who hears the word and yields a harvest a hundredfold what was sown, that's those who hearing the word, they hold it fast in an honest and good heart and they bear fruit with patience. They hear it, they hold it, they bear fruit. You hear it, you hold it, you bear fruit with patience. Because even for those who hear it and hold it, hard things come and temptations come, but those who hold it fast with patience, they are constantly plucking out the rocks of those hard and bitter thoughts against God. They're constantly pulling the weeds of idolatry, the temptation to turn to the things that the world offers. Some of you right now in a room this size, inevitably there are some of you on the verge because hard things in your life or because the pleasures of this world. Some of you are addicted to porn. Some of you are messing around with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Some of you are trying alcohol to see if that will satisfy your soul. And I want to urge you, hear the word that is set before you day after day after day and receive it and hold it fast and bear fruit with patience. Jim Elliott, that missionary to uh, the uh, Waurani people group in Ecuador, he said, uh, it will be a worse fate for these American kids who grew up with the Bible than for these demon-worshiping natives who never even heard of such a thing as writing. I think about the, the privilege it is to have the word of God available to us, and yet, as Jesus says, to those whom, to whom much is given, much will be required. You are a hearer of the word already. What kind of hearer are you? Deuteronomy 29, 18, Moses gives this warning to the people of Israel and he says, beware, watch out, be careful, lest there be in you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit. This is a gracious thing from God to say this to us. Watch out for a root in you that bears poisonous and bitter fruit. Here's what the root is. One who, when he hears the words of this covenant, he blesses himself in his heart and says, I shall be safe while I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. Me? I'm fine. I went to a Christian school. I was baptized when I was eight days old. I've got it all. I'm fine while I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. Watch out. That is a poisonous root. And this will lead to the sweeping away of moist and dry alike. The Lord will not be willing to forgive him, but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will smoke against that man and the curses written in this book will settle upon him and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. You think God loves us to warn us like that? Why else would he tell us? For our own sakes, turn and why would you die? Hear the word, hold fast to it and bear fruit with patience. And if you're holding fast to the word today, then may this word be grace to you to motivate you. Keep going. Keep bearing fruit 30, 60, 100 times what is being sown into your life today. The fact that you're sitting here this morning means God is kind to you because here you are again hearing the word. Is it falling on soil that's receiving it and bearing fruit or on a hard heart that grows increasingly bitter? If you find your heart tuning this out, take responsibility for that. 
don't blame your Bible teachers and don't blame the administration and don't blame the chapel speakers who come in here. Well, you guys have chapel twice a week? God bless you. That is phenomenal. If you find your heart growing hardened, take responsibility and recognize my heart is hard against that. God, help me. It's not anybody else's fault. Your, your heart is hard. That's from within you. And God is kind to soften hard hearts so that his word, the word of Christ crucified for our sins, risen to life for our justification, would bear fruit in us for the glory of God and the good of this world. And so I urge you, receive it, believe it, trust it, respond to it, do it. Don't be like Andy. Be careful how you hear. Let's pray. Father, how gracious you are to give us your word, which tells us about all of your greatness and all of your glory and all of your power and your beauty and your worth and how, how needy we are that we hear your word and so frequently turn from you to empty things that can't satisfy our hearts. Oh God, forgive us for the contempt we heap on you when we believe the lies of the enemy that you don't love us and that you're not good and that the hard things in our life mean that you've abandoned us when all you've ever done is love us and promise to work all things for our good. Oh God, when I think about the harvest that could come from the seeds that are sown on these hearts through a Christian education, what a what a glorious thing that could be for the good of the world. So let these hearts receive and hold fast and with patience bear fruit to the glory of your name and for the joy of the world. Amen. Will you please stand and sing with us our last song? Father, it's who you are. 
It's who you are. It's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Child of God. You are dismissed.